Hello, good evening, and welcome to the National Parents Union Presents Speak Your Truth with yours truly, the Vet Dukes. How's everyone doing this evening? I do hope that you are doing well. I like to start off by asking you that each night just to do a check-in. Um, too often we are just so busy saying, hey, how you doing, and not really listening to what the person on the receiving end of that question really has to say in their response. So I really do hope that you all are doing well in light of, in light of everything, there'll always be problems in life, but no matter what, finding a way to rise above. Um, I'm having a great day. Um, I'm happy. I'm always happy to be here to come on. I love interaction. I love um, talking with people. I really enjoy hearing other people's stories, our stories, our testimonies, our personal narratives, our biographies and autobiographies are just, that's why we're here, they're our lives and we're so interconnected. And if it's one thing that this pandemic has taught me, it's uh, really highlighted for me just how connected, interconnected we are globally um, and really just, as a human race, um, we're very interconnected. At least we should be. Um, sometimes it feels like we're not connected enough. But one of the ways, when, um, as you know, I really love to, uh, I'm intrigued by, and at the same time baffled by the intersection of education and incarceration, because those two things one would think would be mutually ex exclusive, but instead, um, one feeds the other um, more and more school has become a pipeline for prison and not for everyone but definitely for young black children young brown children uh, children from marginalized backgrounds are, are more likely to in their schooling be over policed and over managed and um, over represented in special education classrooms, overrepresented in suspension sites, and overrepresented in uh, prison. And so today we have a guest with us who is going to share with us part of his journey, particularly his journey with um, education and incarceration. Please join me in welcoming our guest tonight Mr. Messiah Ferguson. Welcome, Messiah. Hi, Messiah. Hello, how are you doing? I'm doing Good evening. Well. How are you, sir? I'm fine, and yourself. I hope you're well. Yes, I am. Thank you for being here tonight, Messiah. I do appreciate you sharing your, um, your experiences in terms of your education, and um, your subsequent incarceration. Would you mind sharing a bit of your story with our viewers tonight? Um, no problem. Um, I, uh, unfortunately, I went to prison at the age of 16. I was in the 11th grade. Um, and through that process, there were, they, had, they had taken the Pell Grant, so there was no um, higher education in the prison system. Um, that was in 94, they took the Pell Grant, so there was no education in the prison system, no higher education. So once I acquired my GED, there was pretty much nothing else for me to do. And I unfortunately got caught up into the prison culture um, as a young um, adolescent entering the prison system, I got caught in the prison culture. Um, some years later, certain groups started putting um, college programs in certain prisons. And um, to make a long story short, I entered one of the programs in Auburn Correctional Facility. They was offering Cornell credits. So um, I always was a, um, a student of knowledge, right? So I jumped into it and just to see what it was about. And I ended up transferring to another facility, Sing Sing, and they offered behavioral science. And um, honestly, the um, behavioral science, it's like, you know, um, God is the best to plan this because it was a lot of courses, a lot of um, majors that I may have taken that wouldn't have piqued my interest like that, wouldn't have opened me up like behavioral science. And it 
showed me, you know, um, my whole moral base was a little off. Um, it opened my eyes into how other demographics view things and how um, our demographic or the demographic where I grew up at, our value system is a little different. So um, it opened up my eyes to um, taking some criminology courses and to the why um, I ended up in certain situations, you know, not to justify it, but to understand it. So with that knowledge, I was able to um, better myself a tremendous amount. And how old were you at the time when you were able to now start taking college credits? Well, when you went in, you hadn't finished high school yet. Right. So, um, were you afforded classes, a GED classes, in the first uh, correctional facility where you were incarcerated? Yeah. Well, um, when I came to prison, I was on um, Rikers Island. And when I first came up to the state, they offer GD programs. One, I, I always was a little academically inclined. So I got my GD um, in like 95. So let's back up a little, cause you said you were, you said something that intrigued me now. You said I've always been academically inclined. And so I don't know if uh, you know or not, um, cause oh, everyone, this he's a Messiah and uh, my husband, John are friends. So that's how we know each other. But this is actually our first time actually like talking like this. So I don't um, know him. So you're viewing our first conversation really. So you piqued my interest as a teacher now because I'm curious to see what were your educational experiences, you know, leading up to 11th grade? What was school like for you? Um, honestly, I am the um, child of a teacher. So, um, learning has always been in my household prior to going to school. And honestly, it was kind of like the gift and the curse because, because I was, I learned so quickly, it left me um, bored and, you know, just ready to do mischief. Yeah. But academically, not all my teachers praised me, but they said that, you know, he has a behavioral problem. And it was more so of, um, I think the educational system at that time, um, they didn't really know what to do. Um, it was plenty, they, they, they were ready to place me in special ed a few times. Your um, story is like so many other, particularly young black men that I have been teaching now for 12 years. And mm -hmm. that story that you, your own story is the story of so many yeah. young black men whose energy, who are, so basically you're saying you were talented and gifted. That's what I'm hearing, right? Right. You know, yeah. The work very quickly. You were raised in an environment at home where learning was the norm, exposure to books and education. You go to school, you're on fire, you're catching it quickly. And instead of a teacher looking at you as a little black boy and saying, wow, we should put Messiah in some talented and gifted classes or see what else he can do, you're viewed as a behavioral problem. The energy you're exerting is now, what's wrong with him? He's disruptive in class. Maybe he has a learning disability. How come he's unable to sit still? Let's get him in special education. Right. What, right? Does that sound about right? Yeah, and the irony of that is, um, so on one end you have the, um, let's get him in special education, let's medicate him or, mm -hmm. But as I got a little older, the same problem kind of persisted, but they sent me to a talented and gifted class. So that was the other end of the spectrum. And so, a, well, how old were you at that time when you um, were talented? I think I was, when I, when I entered my first talented and gifted class, I think I was in the sixth or seventh grade. Okay. And, um, and I think that was more of a, a correct move because what I really needed was more challenging work, you know, um, so. Yes, and what you're bringing out isn't, uh, um, and this is happening so organically, uh, because again, we've never spoken about this before, right. but this highlights something that I talk and write about so often, where we have to, how a teacher views his or her students can have such an impact in the opportunities that that student is afforded, you know, yeah. 
from the beginning, your talent should have been recognized as such instead of seeing you as a problem. So that's an issue right there. And also, you needed more challenging work. Yes. You needed to be doing more. Education is just kind of on this one track mode where I hope for those listening, if you are in education, whether you're an educator and administrator, if you're in charge of a program, if you make educational policy decisions, please be on the lookout for our talented and gifted students of all backgrounds because we're underrepresented in that space. So tell me about your talented and gifted class. How did you like it or what was it like? Okay, the talented and gifted class, it was it was pretty good and it was challenging. And it also um, led my, my parents to send me to Catholic school for high school because they felt that a, um, I went to all boys school. So they felt that if I re they removed the female element, it would help. But also because the, um, the work was more challenging and it was it was just a more controlled environment. But one thing that I did learn through school at, later on, um, through higher education, um, is my learning style. Um, and it was it was interesting because I, I realized that you know everyone can't learn the same way. And sometimes that's what I think about me. I think that me in particular as an individual, a lot of my teachers didn't realize that I learned different. But what um, is style? What did you learn about yourself? What how do you learn best? Um interesting story. So I was in the second grade, right? And I always had, you know, I was always good at math. Okay. So we had, I think it was called the citywide math test, right? Um and I, you know, I scored the highest score possible. Um, instead of, and I didn't use scrap paper and that was mandatory at the time. You used your scrap paper, show your work. And I didn't do that. And they made me take the test again, supervised by myself. Mm -hmm. so you figured out all of the answers in your head. You didn't do any, show any work as they I, didn't, I had to teach myself to do the math because I couldn't, the way they were teaching it, I couldn't do it that way. Process it that way. Exactly. I couldn't process it that way. Mm. So when I taught myself, I taught myself, I didn't teach myself to, to use scrap paper. So, and instead of um, saying, wow, that was amazing or whatever, they made me take the test again by myself supervised, you know, so, cause they thought I cheated mm. in the second grade. I don't know how I got all those answers, but, um, you cheated and got every single answer correctly. So again, the implicit bias of those educators who were grading those that exam, who were supervising you, there was some bias there where it was no consideration given to say, well, isn't it possible that Messiah could be really a little genius in front of us? Right. And how might that, if that decision was made, how might that have changed the course of your life? Because what doors may have opened to you now when, you know, if a child did that, I'm thinking you'd get an award, you'd go to the principal's office for a good reason, they might call your parents and say, we'd like to get him tested, we think that, you know, he should go to this school, or those are the things that I think would happen as an educator, but what instead happened? Um, they gave my teacher, um, teacher of the year, or something of that nature, my math teacher. Oh. Um, oh. And, and um, that was pretty much it. So the math teacher who did not teach you the math got the accolades right. and the awards and the acknowledgement. All the accolades. You got. Yeah, nothing. but I, and 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 that was one of the and when I reflected upon that, that's what realized. That's what I. That's what made me realize. One of the things that made me realize the earliest example is that I learned different. And if I learn different, then other people learn different, right? So um, I think it's kind of a teacher's job to see, wait a minute, this kid right here might not be processing it the way everyone else is. Yeah. Let's see what kind of specific aid I can get them. You know, um, yeah, and also to offer opportunities in the classroom for that child to, to shine, right? Yeah. It's to show 
no, this is, I do this really well, Miss Dukes. This, you know, there has to be an opportunity for that. But if all I do is test them one way or assess them one way, some kids will always shine, but some kids will never shine because that's not their way. Right. Yeah. Wow. Important point. Some kids learn visually, some learn audio, some learn, you know, you have to use real life examples to, you know, so everything is different. But I, 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 um, I so appreciate that behavioral science. Mr. Dukes, how you doing, my brother? I'm doing well. It's a Good pleasure, man. Here. Good to see you. Pleasure, man. Definitely. He well, came in at the right time. He's also um, studying behavioral sciences. So <laughs> you both are in the same program, I believe. Could you guys have a conversation, kind of shed some light, <laughs> right? So Messiah was talking to us about his early, I don't know if you were hearing or not. A little bit. I heard right? briefly. So his early. Some things I never heard you. I know he played basketball. Like, we never really talked about <laughs> Education on top. Okay. Yeah, he played ball as well. Well, he, he played with Zandar. I remember he said. Oh wow. What? Zandar. Zandar, you said. No, Felipe Lopez. I went to Rice. Oh, but what I'm saying, didn't you play with Zandar? You knew Zandar? So? Um, against maybe. Okay. Yes. All right, go, go ahead though. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, you took us <laughs> off somewhere else, but I can tell the you had that's a yell greeted. Um. No, but um, Messiah was telling us about some of his earlier educational experiences. Yeah. And um, so now we're talking about programs like behavioral sciences yeah, once he started studying in college. Okay. Um, and he also went through the same program, right? Yes. So yeah. tell us about that, Messiah and John. Oh, but I, I would ask you, Messiah, did you, um, you had graduated, I think, while we were at Sing Sing or? Or you you know, uh, I when I left Sing Sing, I had acquired, I believe, sixty six credits, but oh. I hadn't actually. Um, I was six core credits shy of an associate's. Gotcha. So, um, that's when I left. Um, Sing Sing. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, because you know, oh. I, myself, what I'm doing, I'm still going to school now. Like I gotta, I'm starting all over again to do the, to get my bachelor's. I just graduated with my associates from the Manhattan campus of uh, okay. with Mercy. But you, did you do that as well? Like, did you come home and finish up your yours? Or uh, so when I left there, um, I, I ended up in another facility who were who was um, linked to Hudson Link. They also had um, a, um, a college program there, uh, and they were offering, which is also a good um, program. They were offering. Um, organizational management. Mm, yeah. So I acquired another 36 credits there. However, I'm still short. And um, when I came back to society, it was so many things going on that I, I was, I, one of the things that I wanted to do was go back to school, but you know, securing employment and then finding the, the, the right employment to be able to compliment me going to school. Um, it's been a little challenging, but I definitely would like, because I feel like I haven't had the, um, I, I, I love the knowledge, but I feel like I didn't have the, uh, the cap, right? The, um, I didn't graduate. I didn't, you know, I didn't get that good feeling like of accomplishment. Of, yeah. you, know, the, you have 90 something credits. You said 66 and, and 36. That's, that's about 102. 102 yeah. credits. A bachelor's degree is 124. Right. An associate's degree is 64. Yeah. I'm sorry, a bachelor's degree is 128, and an associate's is 64 credits. So you've exceeded an associate's degree, that's for sure. Right. But the way you know, um, for the behavioral science, I was only missing, I believe, ironically enough, a math and um, a computer course. Yes, we, that's the course that John had to take. That's what, that's towards the end of the program. Yeah. Right. Right, that's one of the last courses that you take in that program. And as, as um, John knows, you don't get to um, take the courses that you may need. Yeah. So you may end up with um, 90 credits and still don't have the core credits you need for an associate's. So even when the program, and so for those that don't know, the, the um, prison is, uh, 
education is not paid for through public funds in um, some state prisons. It is paid for through private organizations, not for profit, not for profit organizations. And one of them is Hudson Link. Shout out to Hudson Link. Mm, um, uh, yes, and the Hudson Link pro, um, pays for the educations of men and women who are incarcerated at, um, I don't know how many, but I know in Sing Sing, definitely it's offered there. I believe Bedford Hills is offered in quite a few. I believe they have about five facilities now. Yeah, okay. Five facilities. So that's a program that John and Messiah are talking about. Um, but we see a flaw in it in that how can you get, because of the course offerings, yeah. you know, like if it, the course is not offered, you have to keep waiting, which delays your graduation, which delays. And so Messiah has all these credits, but still doesn't have a degree. Right. That's the problem. Well, it's, it's kind of, um, they only have a certain amount of, of, of classes they can offer per semester. And because it's continuous, um, because John may need this particular class this semester, mm -hmm. it may not be offered. They only may have like maybe four or five different courses going on at a time. So you may have to wait and John may have to wait a, a, a year for this one class. And I may just happen to fall into it at the right time and catch it when John catches it and I, and I graduate with 60 credits and he graduates with 96. Yeah. We've experienced that yeah. to some extent where like I'm waiting for this class or they're not offering this class. And when you're outside, you're like, you're delayed. Like you're trying to get as many classes as you can. So you're mm -hmm. not delaying your graduation. Well, well there's something that, that, that I want to um, bring to the attention of the viewers because you raise a great point, Messiah, about coming home and finding those life challenges that we all had to be up against, you know? Um, and some of us have a little bit of cushion or installation, if you will, and others may not. And, um, and even if you have the installation, there's sometimes you may be in, in, the, in the marriage, like I'm with, with my wife and say, well, look, you may have installation here, but you gotta get up and, and get your degree or you gotta go to work. You know, I want you to get a great job or get your career started. And these are some of the many, uh, many, uh, I would say, I, I don't want to say just like barriers, but they're definitely some of the many hurdles that we have to, uh, to, to, to try to, to, to jump those hurdles successfully without falling. Um, having said that, hearing you speak about it just made me reflect on myself because I also went through that, you know, for a brief moment before I even got the degree. I was, I was doing little odd jobs. I was trying to make ends meet the best way I know how without doing things that we learned that got us in situations that we came from, you know? So it's like, yo, what do I do? You know, and, and people breaking my back. I never forget the last job that I had, like on some uh, day work. First of all, I'm gonna start out that I had some great jobs, right? But I didn't have the skill for it. You know, people that I know, they own businesses. They're like, yo, we got you, come over here. But even then, I couldn't work because I didn't know the skill. I don't know anything about boilers. I don't know about making glasses like my, my cousin has a designer thing. I, I couldn't do none of these things. So I was left in the dust, you know? So so um, then I didn't want to explore the creative part because I had creative differences with writing because, you know, I, I, because of my religion and everything that I, that I do, I'm trying to find out how can I do these things, you know, with writing that the vet would even approve of sometimes. Sometime because so it wouldn't be raunchy material. <laughs> um, uh, so 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 the, so so why I bring that up to say this: I went to this last odd job that I had, which was like another day a day work. Um, and the man that I know is some, a friend of ours. I call him Uncle, but worked me hard. I did this job, and that was the that was the interest back into my that secured me back into Mercy College. Because once that once that that work laid on me and I and I realized my age, I realized, you know, that I couldn't I couldn't do this uh potentially like to, to, to keep doing this. How many years would I be doing back breaking work? Did you have a similar experience to that? I had a very very similar experience um because 
I want to just put this out there. Um, I don't want, I didn't, I didn't, when I came home, I didn't want to take employment that I didn't want to do, that, I, that I didn't enjoy or that I dreaded going to work every day. I did understand and I do understand that you have to, you know, make ends meet, right? And we can't jeopardize our freedom doing that. So you have to make, take certain sacrifices. So I took some tough jobs um, where they were, they were, they were killing me. And, and I realized this, and I realized this prior to coming home, I'm a cerebral person. I'm not really a manual laborer. Uh, so that's why it was definitely, and it is definitely imperative for me to get back to school to increase my value. Yeah, um, absolutely. You need that paper to have certain doors open to you. And even if you could like get a hookup or net networking, right? A friend of a friend knows a friend who's looking for someone, they still need to see like, well, what are his credentials? They matter. You definitely have, but I, I like that you learned about yourself, how you learn, what you like, what's interesting, because that is, the, po the point of school right to learn you know more about yourself what was some of the coursework you took that really interested you or perhaps what do you see yourself doing what would you like to be doing um i love working with at-risk youth that is something that i do voluntarily um i would definitely love to uh use what i love to do to earn money um so i do some you know, speaking engagements. I, do, I have a mentorship program that I do every Wednesday um, here in Harlem. Um, so, so let's know, that's, a mentorship program in Harlem. It's the Sledge Group. Um, Sledge Group Inc. It's on um, hundred. It's Toro College on 125th Street. Okay. Um, they meet every Wednesday, but due to Corona, you know, they haven't been meeting. Um, ironically enough, they've been meeting on Zoom, and I haven't set up my Zoom app. So now that um, I figured this thing out a little uh, well I don't know if I really figured it out but maybe I can join them you're here you did yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's another thing though you know technology oh, that we had to learn talk about that. Um, my experience with school all the all the younger younger people there or just people that was even some may have been my age or um or just slightly younger the point is though that they were far more advanced when it came to doing the computer the basic fundamentals that I had to eventually, like, I didn't go into college. I wanted to go to campus because we never, well, I never experienced that, right? right. I wanted to go on a college campus, being I had that chance. I said, oh, I want to see how this feels. I want to, you know, get my cap and gown like you spoke about. I want to do all these normal things that we should have been doing, you know, that, that for whatever reason, we got into the streets and we winded up in those circumstances. So what happened now, I started seeing, like, a lot of the, I mean, the professor was looking at me like, you know, come on, like, this is like, like, let's go, let's go. And I had to pull her aside one day and say, look, professor, I just did X amount of years and I really haven't been around a computer. I don't know the fundamental, you know, or the, the, the basic steps of this. I've just learned my phone and you're telling me about Excel and, and all these PowerPoints Like, I don't know. I, I know I'm here to learn, but I just... I just need some extra help. Too advanced. You, you know, needed, like courses before that yeah. were too too much of a jump. Even to start the computer was 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 challenging. It wasn't inside. for someone who never used. And it could be intimidating to the point that you know you neglect or not you know neglect certain acts. You just don't do it because it's too too complicated. Yeah. It's happened to me. Mm -hmm. um, That's what happened. That was my experience. You know, so uh, again. I, I couldn't help but to, to touch on that because I think a lot of people, the misconception is that somehow we come home and people think like they have somewhat somewhat of a resume button on them where they're like, okay, they remember us from a time. But, but then it's also uh, coupled with they expect us to know these things that they've been out in society learning like, oh, you don't know this? You don't know about the phone? You don't understand about this? Like, oh, I thought you knew. Oh, yeah, you did just come home. And it's 
It's a sometimes, all sometimes all. the explanation gives it's it's in the explanation they 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 throwing out things that you have no knowledge of. Yes. Oh, just put this together with this and that, and you're saying, well, what's this and that though? I don't know what that is. You know, how to do that? But YouTube is one of the best inventions though that they have. Yeah. I'm familiar with that. I, I YouTube everything. Yeah, in in observing John, because it's a really unique situation yeah. to um, be be an educator, be his wife, be with him every day to see his journey in a way that no one else sees it in his reentry process. And I've been most grateful to you too because that is a modality that I see he immediately. Um, once he learned the basics of the phone and learned about YouTube, he would go there like first. I could say that's the first app yeah. that he really was like, yes, I'm comfortable with this. This makes sense. It's teaching me stuff. Um, so he wouldn't even Google it. He would YouTube it more so, you know? Quick story. Yes. I came home and in, 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 in September, I acquired my license immediately. So in November, in October, I was driving, right? My mom let me borrow her car as soon as I got my license. And I remember sitting in the car and it was raining hard, mm. like really hard. As soon as I got in the car, it started raining. Mm. And I remember sitting there and thinking, wow, I don't even know how to turn the windshield wipers on. I was too embarrassed to call anyone. So I, I looked it up on YouTube. And, uh, <laughs> and I was like, that's my friend. YouTube is my friend ever since. My best buddy. Anytime I have a question. Yeah, I've been using it a lot too. Yeah. Have and, to. and it's that part that I see where it's like, you don't know something that all of us know. Mm -hmm. Even babies come out. Now you'll see a baby pick up a phone and instinctively know to swipe. No one had to teach the baby that. They just know it, right? And then to be an adult and not know certain things, we're not, you, I'm not used to that. Like I've never been around anyone who didn't know this as an adult. So even as much as you're like, oh, you're a teacher. Yeah, but I never had to teach anyone that. Right. So you're right, even knowing how to break something down to the point where you can explain it but not dumb it down so much so that you're insulting the person's intelligence too because you are a grown man, you know what I mean? So it's very nuanced. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing dynamic. And because I, of the behavioral science degree, mm -hmm. um, I like to fancy myself as a, uh, like a fake psychologist, um, <laughs> sociologist or so. Yes. And I, I, it's interesting for me to watch me like mm -hmm. um chronicling my progress and 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 some of the and looking back at some of the things that i couldn't navigate um just a short while ago and how simple it is for me now it's amazing are you chronicling it are you writing it down it sounds like your phd dissertation right there <laughs> yeah um and 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 also um i want to say this too um to john this i don't know if this was able to take place prior to my coming home but there's a support group and not one in particular but just of people who are progressive and who are returning to society that stay in contact with one another. And I think that, and, 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 and they, they provide, you know, all kind of insight because we all have a similar understanding. And, and although, you know, you spend an overwhelming amount of time with your husband and it's, it's, it's a camaraderie, it's an understanding with these men that is different. And I think that that's, paramount to my um, transition 
it has been paramount because everything that I've experienced, there's someone in this group that has experienced it already and may be able to give me some insight and vice versa. I may be able, you know, someone may be going through something and I may be, be able to explain it to them and that may help me and them at the same time, you know? So I believe that that networking system is, is imperative as long as you have the right people in, in your system. Yeah, wow. I agree with that. And that sounds like something for me to consider even here, because um, I'm with the National Parents Union. We are really advocating for um, parents who were formerly incarcerated and who are with not only returning home, but the aspect of coming home that involves them with their child, their children, their children's education, like how, what spot do they have in all of that? Do they have a seat at the table? Are they respected as their parents? And so support group sounds like something that um, needs to be offered in a more widespread way. It's like, no, this is a valuable way to come home and have a space for people who were formerly incarcerated to have each other. Because right. we're outsiders in this. We don't know what it's like. And I do see it differently, like when you're around um, guys that you were locked up with. Yes. There's just a way y'all talk and understand and joke and laugh and everything. It's, it's a brotherhood. I, I mean, you know, it's certain things like my note that may make John chuckle because of a memory that mm -hmm. even in explanation, someone else wouldn't understand. Yeah. Um, I remember um it was <laughs> I was I was in a um a OSHA class. Um I was doing an OSHA training class and something came up and the acronym SOP came up, right? So like three people in the class, their reaction alone led me to believe that they were incarcerated at some point. And <laughs> They told on themselves, as I say. Yeah. And um, yeah. we had a little dialogue afterwards, and it was interesting. But it's just like things like that, certain little, um, it was something else with the phone. I remember um, going with a friend of mine who had just come home to get his phone. Mm -hmm. And he had been home for like three weeks. And he was, so to get the phone, they were asking him his email. Mm -hmm. And... He didn't know. He was like, hold on, let me call my sister. And I remember going through all of those things. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, like certain little nuances. I remember getting on a train and trying to navigate the Metro car, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just, a, it's, a, it's a bunch of things that I agree. other people can relate to. That were been that were in certain similar circumstances as you. Um, I'm sure I have a best friend who is a teacher, been teaching for over 20 years. Um, I'm sure that you and him can have a conversation and identify with each other as teachers, mm -hmm. probably in a way that I can't or John can't. Right. Um, lingo we'll use and we'll start going in because you start you know, thriving off of each other because, oh, you get it. You understand what I'm talking about. You're right. It, it was, you know, it made me think about the time when we met up uh, for Silent, Silent on Cry, I think. Oh, he called. was there? Yes, he came um, at oh, the so ladder I park. have met you oh, before. Of course. Uh, <laughs> when you came down the steps, I met. Like, had a down, like, oh, a okay, okay. Went on um, out in Harlem. <laughs> and, I, and, and Babette was all excited, like, watching all of us talk. Like, it was me, you, Brother Lab. I was excited. I know, yes, your mom. Watching from the sideline, loving the energy. Just to see all of us being able to speak. And I haven't seen Butter Lab, but that was my first time seeing him after all that time he's done. So to just be in and then, then finally get a chance to see you, that was my first time seeing you since you was home. So it was just, it was a beautiful night to be able to do that. Like you're you both saying, we, we do share that bond where, well, of course, because we, we brothers in the sense where we we've been with each other, You're my man. But but um, there's there's things that we ever when we around each other and we do talk, you always hear that bit of, oh, it, it's sort of like a nostalgia in a sense. Even though it was in a horrible place, we still had our we had to have our own good times. We had to make 
good moments, you know, whether we were cooking, you, me, King, and we eating and chuckling, uh, talking honey talk and stuff like that. Things that it may not seem like something to an outsider, like you said, in society, but um, in our shoes was a big deal. You know, just to have a bowl, a bowl that now we're eating off plates again, but, but just to have a bowl was a big deal. You know, some place on home. I, I, you know, I would liken it to soldiers returning from war, right? If you were in a platoon with a soldier, you have a bond with him that is, it's just different. It's inexplainable. You have been in the trenches with this person. You have been through some things that you may not even speak about to other people. Um, it's just an experience that you shared together. So. Um, it's, it's, it's a similarity in that regard. Um, when you return home, you have this shared experience that you feel like only this select group of people can understand. Um, some people may empathize, but they can't really understand, right? So it's a, like, it's, it's a sense of comfort in a sense to be able to talk to someone and they, they're not trying to understand, they already do. Um, <laughs> you, you don't have to explain the back story or anything, you know. So it's I, 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 again, man, I think this is um, we like we we normally, the vet normally has guests on like you and I, and then she'll but we'll talk about parenting. We talk, but there are times and like, moments like this that we have to talk about reentry, we have to talk about what men and women that are coming home from incarceration, coming back to society, returning citizens, how are, how are, how is society viewing, viewing us? How are we viewing society? How, how is the work, you know, for us? Is there any jobs for us? You know, opportunities, I think all these things are, are, are the education, is it, is it um, fair to say that we're gonna be able to do education plus do um, uh, uh, have have a job? Will we be able to have a sustainable life? You know, le legit. And um, I think that's what I hear really from this conversation as well. As we, as we, as you and I enter into it together. I don't know exactly what you and the Rev was speaking about prior to this, but I hear more of that. Like, yo, there's like we do need the support. Well, do I have my wife? My wife can't be everything for me. The vet can't be everything for me. You know, my mom can't be everything for me. And, and in my case, my mother's declining, you know, in, in the sense of age would help. So I, what am I going to do? You know, I thank God that I'm, I'm, I'm moving forward, but it's still a fight. It's still a fight. And the vet has to go through it, the most part of it, while I'm sometimes oblivious to some of the things that I'm making an error in until she's like, wait a minute, look at this. And then, you know, you have to have these people in our corner to, to whether it's your wife, your, like you said, our comrades that have already been through it, we need that. Yeah. That support system is important. Um, also, back to education, um, that is the thing that has prevented me from deviating from the plan um, because I, you know, not only has my value system changed, the way that I look at everything changed. Um, that's why, I mean, honestly, that behavioral science degree opened, I mean, not degree, because I didn't receive the degree, but courses, it opened me up to so much, even to be able to um, have conversations with people that are from a different demographic than I grew up in. Um, I can understand a little more their viewpoints, you know, even, you know, it, it, it gave me ability to not agree with someone, but understand how they can come up with that conclusion based upon their life experiences or, you know, so it just opened me up so much that um, I appreciate Hudson Link once again for um, affording us that opportunity because like I said, in 94, they just took the Pell Grant from the prison system. Mm -hmm. So um, it would just be luck of the draw if you land in the facility that happened to have someone who decided to fund uh, 
a nonprofit organization or, or, or nonprofit organization happened to want to put a college program in a prison. And I believe there were only like two or three for a few years. Right. Um, I think it's something that should be in all prisons, to be quite honest with you. If the job is to correct someone's behavior, if someone's deviant behavior that wound them up in prison, right? That's the goal of incarceration according to them. Then how could education not be a part of that correction and a part of that rehabilitation to come back home? And if someone's around for 20 years, you're locking the people for 20 years, 30 years at a time and you don't deem it fit to educate them and you're getting so much money per year more money is spent on a person in prison than on students outside every year. So America's deeply flawed in its own ideologies. It's like the writing's right there on the wall. You claim to be doing something, but you're not doing it. And the statistical data shows that when incarcerated men come out educated, the recidivism rate is dramatically lower. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Because you have purpose, you have focus. You can come home and do something. You can come home and, and take care of yourself. Forget about anyone else. And I tell John this all the time. You have to be able to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And what incarceration does, it makes you dependent, very dependent. It you have absolutely to does. Survive without it. And so that's, not, that's counteractive to what adulthood is. Mm -hmm. The whole point is like you're... It's, Regression, because the whole point of getting older is to become more independent, gain your, you know, your footing as an adult in society. But prison takes adults and puts them in situations where they have to revert back to, to kids yeah. in, in a lot of ways. One of, the, one of the main things that I see that it made me reliant is on, on I'm really bad with time management because in prison, they manage your time for you. Um, they tell you, they allot a lot of time for you to take a shower. They allot a specific time for you to eat, a specific time for you to have recreation, work out, whatever you like to do recreationally. And you become so accustomed to that, that um, when I first came home for a few months, I would go day, a, a whole day, and it would be like 8 p.m. and I, wouldn't have eaten because I was so accustomed to the schedule. The scheduling, even if I didn't go to the mess hall when they called for, you know, certain whatever lunch, dinner, um, I knew that they were calling it. So I knew that, okay, this is my time that I have to eat. I should make something to eat now. Mm -hmm. And it was times where I'd be out all day and, and my stomach could be rumbling. I'm like, what did I eat today? And I hadn't eaten anything. So um, my time management was way off. Um, you go from wanting the days to move faster to not having enough hours in a day. Um, so it's, it's, that was something that, like you said, we don't, it's kind of like a arrested development. We get stuck into a, a, um, whatever it was we were at before and they take care of us till we come home and we have to figure it out all over again. In a very different world. You brought up so much, Miss. I would love to have you back on. Um, I would love for you to write. I really see you as um, a writer. I hope you are documenting your experiences, your journaling. I hope that you are in some way making a record of your growth and your journey. Um, I'm learning so much just in this conversation, not only about you, but about John, it gives me a deeper insight um, into some of the experiences that you both had inside and how you're doing now, um, now that you're home. I'm happy you're home. Welcome <laughs> home. Thank you. Welcome right. home. Welcome <laughs> home. Happy to have you home. Thank you for sharing some of your story with us, your life. We don't take that lightly at all. Mm -hmm. um, I know many will be blessed by what you have shared. Um, mm -hmm. And just thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Thank you. I really appreciate you, man. Love you and all. all Can't right. you physically, you know, when things uh, really die down with COVID, I've been kind yeah. of still quarantining, but God bless, man. All right. God bless you too. Y'all be safe and enjoy your evening. Yeah.
Me too. So, well, Thank you, you so got... much. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us at Speak the Truth. We'll see you again on Thursday, 7.30 p.m. Eastern time. Until then, be well and take good care. Remember to speak the truth. Good night. Good night.